Good morning, saints. Good morning. And welcome to St. James Episcopal Church. For those of you joining us online in Glastonbury, Connecticut. If you're worshiping with us for the first time this morning, please know that whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey of faith, you're welcome here at St. James and invited to participate fully in our service. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. A reading, a reading from Genesis 28. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it, upon the, set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. 
Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Please read portions of Psalm 139 by half verse after the asterisk. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You trace my journeys and my resting places. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips. You press upon me behind and before. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make my way to your you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning, Even there, your hand will lead me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me. Darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Search me out, O God, and know my heart. Look well whether there be any wickedness in me. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness upon our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we await for adoption, the redemption of our bodies, for in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the... Sorry? Jesus did something else. <laughs> Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed seed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Psalm 139 has always been one of my favorite psalms, in part because there's a hint of mystery to it. It's a favorite conundrum for those contemplating a religious vocation, especially in moments of doubt. When you read it, there can be a real question. Is God chasing me to places I don't want to go? Or is God's presence a reassuring presence? The telling verse is verse 6. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? That doesn't sound like somebody running into the embrace of the Almighty. In fact, there is a poem that dates back to the late 19th century entitled The Hound of Heaven by the English poet Francis Thompson that every seminarian is told to read. And it uh, contains images of God not letting go of those called to a vocation in ministry, a God that pursues us until we succumb to God's will. The beloved author C.S. Lewis also referred to the hound of heaven never letting him go. But the context of the psalm tells us a different story. The psalm is a song of David before David is king, fleeing from the mentally deranged King Saul. David has been a faithful servant to Saul, and yet Saul was out to kill him. Imagine David running for his life from the mad King Saul. David is bitter and frustrated over the injustice of what is happening to him, and so he pleads with God to see the truth about who he really is reminding God of what God has done and what God has promised. 
But with his prayer in this psalm, David rediscovers himself as a child of God. He recognizes that God has made him in God's own image. And in his prayer, he slowly finds his way back to the abiding presence that he can only find with God. Rather than a God who is relentless in pursuing us, Psalm 139 supposes a God who seeks us and finds us where we are, just as a parent would seek for a lost child or a shepherd would search for a lost sheep. If in your lifetime you have come to believe that God is a mean or a vengeful or a punishing God, the idea of God knowing your every move and pursuing you or even discovering you such as Adam and Eve were discovered in the book of Genesis, that image is probably not a comforting one. But Psalm 139 is there to comfort. We may feel shame for something we have done or not done, said or not said. Psalm 139 assures us that God never wants us to hide. Shame can place us in prisons of our own making. Psalm 139 reassures us that if we open our hearts to God's presence, God will burst open those prison doors with God's loving, liberating, and life-giving power of love. There is no reason to run away and hide. God is there to protect us and guide us. This is the assurance that we are given in the message that God gave to Jacob in the passage from Genesis. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So we see nothing but blessed assurance in our passages from the Hebrew Bible. But both Paul in his letter to the Romans and Jesus in our gospel passage indicate to us that becoming fully matured parts of God's plan is slightly more nuanced and as yet unfinished process. Paul writes, the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. He describes the whole creation as groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. The power and the guiding support that God promises in Genesis and in Psalm 139 do not make us perfect. They are guideposts and spiritual nurture for life's journey. And what are we to make of those noxious weeds Jesus tells us about in the Gospel from Matthew? This is a great parable because it's one of the few parables that Jesus actually explains in the context of the parable. The late theologian and spiritual director, the Reverend Dr. Margaret Gunther, I know many of you have read some of her books, shares a beautiful reflection on those questions, and I'd like to share it with you today. She writes, I'm in no hurry for that final day. I'm happy to muddle on for a bit, living into the promise of things hoped for but not seen. Just having the promise is enough for now. But lately, I find myself thinking quite a bit about the weeds and wondering whether they have anything to do with me. I try to persuade myself that Jesus is talking about someone else, someone unworthy of saving, all those people who surely have no place in God's kingdom. Surely he's talking about those weedy people whom I would consign to the compost heap if not to the cleansing fire. It's much more comforting to hope that I am pure wheat and that the weeds are quite disposable. She continues, but perhaps the concept of weeds is more complicated than I thought. In my honest moments, I fear that I am not pure wheat, but that I have some qualities of the weeds in me, 
qualities that I need to be free of before I can be truly fruitful. Or maybe I fail to grow and thrive because fine quality durum wheat that I am. I let myself be choked and thwarted by the weeds around me. I bounce back and forth between these two pictures. On the one hand, the people of God are filled with the yearning for God. On the other, we are part of God's garden, active and growing toward the ultimate harvest. Both images remind us that we are living in a not yet time, that we live in radical trust that God's promise will be fulfilled. We wait. We labor. We hope for that which is not seen, but somehow knowing that what Paul calls our glorious liberty as children of God is all that truly matters. I love her reflection on these passages, and I find a certain comfort in them, and I find myself in them. What I think we can take from today's lessons is that God doesn't promise to take all adversity out of our lives, nor does God give us a perfect image of the life to come. What God does do is promise us that God will be present with us on life's journey and gives us the blessed assurance of God's divine love and blessing along the way. Let us pray. Holy One, we awake into a sense of your presence with us. From time to time, today and every day, remind us that each day is a journey into the unknown, but that there is nowhere we can go where you are not with us. Continually remind us of your way, O Lord, that we may walk faithfully in the ways that Jesus leads us in his life and his teachings. Amen. Please stand as you are able. And in the assurance of God's faithfulness, let us pray the articles of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all the people in their daily life and work. 
our families, friends, neighbors, those who are our own. For this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. Fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Jeff and Laura, our bishops, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God and the church. We remember the special needs and concerns of this congregation. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Diocese of Olympia and the Diocese of Oregon. In the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, we pray for St. John's Salisbury, Trinity Seymour, and Christ Church Sharon. And for parish office volunteers, curates, seminary interns, parish assistants and associates, missional curacies, we pray for all who are ill, for all who are in weakness, for all who are bereaved, especially presiding Bishop Michael Curry, Sandra Asaf, Carla Bew, the DeFrancis family, George, Kurt Griffith, Joan Hamill, Fred Manganelli, Bruce Burnham, Bob Therian, Paul Eastland, the Logan family, Ray, Kate, Kate Goodrich, Randy Bresson, the Bresson family, Diane Obernesser, Joan, Nancy Dreyer, Dennis Scott McCumber, and those recovering from acts of violence, that they may find comfort, strength, and healing. I bid your own intentions, either silently or aloud. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. I bid your own intentions, either silently or aloud. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And, and pray praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. I bid your own intentions, either silently or aloud. John Lord. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. So uphold us by your spirit, and that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. For the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us show one another a sign of Christ's peace.
Any business? Oh, here we go. Jeremy's going to contribute. Here we go. <laughs> the treasurer's grandchild brings bills. <laughs> Not too late. Does she have something she wants to put in? No, no, no. Oh, okay. All right. Our offertory hymn is number 290 in the blue hymnal. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us. An offering is a sacrifice to God. All things come from you, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your own creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with James and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. The gifts of God for the people of God. Receive who you are. Become what you receive. The body of Christ.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God our parent, Christ our brother, and the Holy Spirit who gives us breath bless you and keep you this day forevermore. Amen. Do we have any birthdays this week? None? Nary a birthday. Okay. Do we have any wedding anniversaries this week? You almost want to get to coffee hour. <laughs> I'm sure there are some announcements. Madam C. Yes. Yes. Of course. Mike, 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 Mike. There's, no. there's people still no. online. There's people still online? Yes. They're, they're not going to come and serve coffee. No, but they're going <laughs> to. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Repeat after me. <laughs> Six. Six. Thirteen. Thirteen. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. A little louder. Hike. No. <laughs> no, coffee. 
Coffee, okay. Those are the Sundays available in August to serve coffee hour. And I say coffee hour loosely because in the summer we don't serve coffee. It's tea, iced tea, lemonade, water, whatever you choose. Um, this morning we'd like to thank Lisa Gleason who provided our um, fellowship hour, coffee hour. And we could thank you too if you would sign up. So please sign up. Uh, there's a sheet right next to the elevator. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Madam Senior Warden. So just a reminder that uh, next Sunday is our last Sunday that the Outreach Committee will be collecting backpacks and $20 uh, Target gift cards for 30th. What did I say? 20. Oh. We, we got out for it's our game. It's 30 now. <laughs> Right, $30, $30 Target uh, gift cards that uh, we're going to pass along to the Social Services Department for the town. And um, how about those, um, those students in Glastonbury who need some help? Keep talking to pumpkins. Yep. Thanks, Debbie. That's all. Any other announcements? It's nice to be back in my traditional role of priest associate and have a seated um, uh, priest in charge. Um, I've been watching online when I can. Um, when I'm not, uh, I watch it afterwards if I'm at Grace. Um, so it's wonderful to be back with you this morning. Let us go forth into the world as beloved children of God, living in hope, confident in God's promises and bringing the light of Christ wherever we go. Thanks be to God.